Folks, thanks very much Did indeed you? for coming. You're very welcome to this part of the John Hewitt International Summer School. Uh, it's great to see a session like this, which is so popular that every seat is taken under standing room only, with so many people lined up uh, almost to the corridor outside. I think that says an awful lot about the summer school, uh, and if the summer school doesn't mind me saying it, I think it says much more about the panel that we're about to hear from this afternoon. Uh, we're starting roughly in time. We're going to be going on roughly to our end point in about an hour and a half's time, and I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing from our four guests. Can I remind you before we start, if you've got a mobile phone, please turn it to silent, if not off. Uh, if you are going to use a mobile phone to do things like tweeting and so on, you're very welcome to. Use the hashtag J-H-I-S-S, uh, and that will allow yourself or the summer school or anybody else to follow what's been said and to retweet it. Before I introduce the panel, can I also uh, just say that the DUP and Sinn Féin were also asked to participate in the panel uh, this afternoon. They had initially nominated people to participate uh, and then asked to uh, find replacements when they dropped out, but for one reason or another, uh, they weren't able to do so. Uh, my name's Peter Osborne. I'm chairing this session to the best of my ability. Uh, I chair the Community Relations Council just to get that little uh, advertisement in for the CRC. Uh, as we go through the session this afternoon, we're going to look at uh, the last 30 years and what has got us to the place that we're at today. Uh, I suppose that will inevitably take us to the next 30 years as well. We'll sort of break the session up into those two patterns of the last 30 years and the next 30 years. And we ask the panelists some questions. But that's going to be a small part of the session. What we'll try to do is get as much interactive uh, uh, interaction between the panel and the audience here as we can. So I will come to you after about 20 minutes. And if you have something that you want to ask or something you want to say, uh, please show your hand and we'll get to everybody uh, that wants to say something. But uh, we're all here really to hear from this fantastic panel uh, that we have. To my far left, uh, to your right, is Doug Beatty. Uh, Doug Beatty joined the army when he was 16 years old. It was a uh, family tradition, I suppose. He joined the Royal uh, Irish Rangers. Uh, he tells me that within a year or so of that, he was uh, guarding Rudolf Hess in Spandau Prison as a 17-year-old. What an experience I'm sure that was. He served in Bosnia, Kosovo, Iraq, Northern Ireland, Afghanistan, and while there uh, for an action at Helmand Province, he was awarded the Military Cross. His book, An Ordinary Soldier, I'm told, probably by Doug, is an extraordinary read. <laughs> he doesn't have copies here with him, but I'm quite sure if somebody wants to knock his door with a copy, he'll uh, sign it uh, for you as well. In 2016, uh, he left all of that behind and became an MLA. He was touted as a potential leader of the Ulster Unionist Party, but decided not to stand. Beside Doug is uh, somebody that needs no introduction at all. Uh, somebody who I suppose is a legend of the politics of this place over the last 50 years. Uh, Seamus Mallon, as we know, was a former deputy leader of the SDLP. He was a uh, member of the Assembly and the conventions of the 1970s before becoming MP for Nuri and Armagh in 1986. Uh, that was the election uh, that the, the, the by-elections called after the signing of the Iron Gorge Agreement. Uh, Seamus Mallon uh, displaced uh, uh, the previous MP, Jim Nicholson, uh, was the only uh, member of parliament that was overturned in that election. Uh, he was elected to the Assembly in 1998 and was Deputy First Minister from then on. Famously, he said that uh, the Good Friday Agreement was Sunningdale for slow learners. <laughs> I'm going to leave the rest of that up to you to complete. <laughs> Beside Seamus is Stephen Agnew. Stephen Agnew is the leader of the Green Party. Stephen uh, was brought up in Dundonald and Ballybean, as was I, all the best people are. Uh, he then went to Brooklyn's Primary School, all the best people do. Yep. Uh, following that, he went to Grosvenor Grammar School, which I have to say all the best people do. <laughs> and he left Grosvenor and went to Queen's University, which just completes the circle for all the best people. I felt like I was reading my own biography when I was reading Stephen's. <laughs> Stephen, though, uh, became a constituency worker for Green MLA Brian Wilson in North Down, and in 2011 
uh, Stephen succeeded Brian Wilson as uh, MLA for North Down and he retained uh, that seat in the two elections since then. And closest to me is Naomi Long. Again, needs no introduction as with the rest of the panel. Naomi is the leader of the Alliance Party. She has been an MLA and I suppose most famously became MP for East Belfast five years ago. She was the first and to date only elected uh, Alliance Member of Parliament. Um, and she also before that was the Lord Mayor of Belfast and I think only the second woman at that point to have been Lord Mayor. She's a civil engineer by trade, I think, uh, which means that she knows how to build a bridge, but I suppose part of the discussion is how all of us can be involved in crossing those bridges. That's our panel today. We are talking about the last 30 years, and hopefully over the next 30 years as well. Um, and I think it's maybe important as a start to look back on what life was like in Northern Ireland in 1987, 30 years ago. It was the year on the 22nd of June, as everybody here will know, uh, that John Hewitt died, uh, hence the establishment 30 years ago of this summer school. It was also the year that many of us will, mem will remember that Richard Branson crossed the Atlantic in a balloon. I think he landed somewhere uh, in the Mavadic. Rathlin was a little well, that direction. <laughs> up there somewhere. <laughs> he landed in a balloon in the land of the balloons. No, uh, uh, <laughs> um, 1987 was also a year when the troubles were ongoing. And on the 8th of May, eight IRA men were killed at Loch Gaw. On the 8th of November, 11, and as it turned out, 12 people were killed in a bombing at the Enniskillen War Memorial. It was also the year that George Seawright was killed, and it was the year, at the end of the year, the 22nd of December, that John McMichael was killed as well. The politics of the region reflected that. 14 of the 26 councils still had Ulster Says No banners up in 1987. That persisted for a number of years after that. From 1985, with the signing of the Anglo-Irish Agreement, having objected to it with some civil disobedience, Ian Paisley in 1987 decided that he would pay his rates after he was threatened to be taken to the enforcement office. Cahill Daly was saying that the uh, benefits of the Anglo-Irish Agreement weren't feeding through to everyday life and he made quite an issue in 1987 of getting the benefits onto the ground, first of all with the demolish, demolition of Divis Flats. <coughs> The government was being warned about the reaction within the unionist and loyalist community if it closed Harland and Wolf, and they decided not to, and it ended up with a management employee buyout, uh, I think with the help of Mr. Olson. The removal of the union flag was an issue in 1987. There were strikes in shorts as uh, the, the, uh, the workforce went on strike because the employers were trying to remove the union flag in the workplace. And at that time as well, in May 1987, there was a campaign to increase the influence and recognition of the Irish language. Jerry Adams and Martin and Muller in May 1987 met the Arts Council to try to get uh, greater recognition of the Irish language and the work that it does. When you read through some of those things, you think, my goodness, 30 years ago, everything has changed, but nothing has changed. So let me turn first of all to you, Seamus Mallon. You remember those days well. Why is it that everything has changed? Why is it that nothing has changed? I think there's a, a quite simple reason. Uh, nothing to do with the intricacies of policy, but to, to do with uh, a statement I once heard in Market Hill uh, after the pubs closed. And a lady shouted at another lady, if them ones are for it, we are against it. <laughs> and that, of course, is where we're at. George W. Bush, in his own inimitable way, <laughs> if you remember, he said, it's them and us for it. But what do we mean by that? What do we mean by those terms? 
Who are the thems? And who are the us's? And we start, I think when we start to look at that, then we start to see if in effect the politi political process is adequate for the problems that we face. Don't forget the political process was loaded down very early on when the two sovereign governments decided that they would use the putative political process uh, to end decommissioning and to deal with issues which were the business of sovereign governments, not of the individual parties. However, that's beside that point. We don't realise, I think, so far, the damage that has been done by violence, by sectarianism, <laughs> by hatred, and by the them and us theories throughout the place. I know families that are divided. I know town lands that are divided. I know villages that are divided. I know communities that are very much divided. And what has helped to reinforce that division? It surely was the suffering that people had over almost 40 years of violence, of tension, of not knowing if their sons or daughters would come back that evening, or not knowing how the next day was going to bring. That is still there. And believe me, it's very deep in the community. You want some proof of the depth of it? I'd suggest look at the electoral returns of the last Westminster election, where, in effect, the them and the us went for the biggest bully so that they might have their position protected. That, in my view, is part of that result. And why, it is, sorry, why has that been, given the fact that I mean, you were instrumental to politics here in the 80s, the 90s, the Good Friday Agreement, Deputy First Minister, that was 20 years ago, and yet we still have a society as divided as we ever had. Why, why hasn't the agreement delivered? Because the political process hasn't worked. And in many ways, the polit political process have, hasn't worked because of the way you have got these tensions, especially within the, what are now the two largest parties. The community itself didn't work in many ways. Now, I think we could all uh, look back and point to things that we could have done that we didn't that might have improved that situation. I pose the question, did the churches do sufficient? Looking back to that time, did they take to softly, softly approach to the use of violence for sectarian and political reasons. And in just the last point, it is this, that we have never really got to the stage in Northern Ireland, despite the number of years of its existence, we have never got to the point where, in effect, <coughs> the community at large doesn't know the history of the place. Many people weren't taught Irish history. Many people, many schools weren't allowed to teach it. And you have two communities uh, relying 
and the platitudes and the lap the frag around me boys instead of looking at what really happened. Those are some those are some of the issues. And I just make this last point it is this maybe we have to start looking at the pro political process not from a structural administrative point of view although that has to be done as well but to start with what we do to deal with the problems in 12 years neither of the two parties who were in charge that is, in case there's any doubt about it, DUP and <coughs> Sinn Féin. Not one scrap of proper proposals were made in relation to how we as people can live better together. They haven't done it. And that was the whole essence of the Good Friday Agreement. Now, both of those parties started that. One stating that they would smash the agreement, the other refusing to actually, uh, on the morning that George Mitchell did the round of the parties, refused to say they were in favour of it. Are we getting to that point? Are we at a point where we have a political process which feels itself more powerful and more at home in the type of divided community that we have. It's worth thinking about. And I live in a small village. I've born there, lived there all my life. And uh, how often have I heard in a, not such a soft whisper, at the other end of the bar. What does that fucker think he's doing in here? Does he not know this is a Protestant bar? <laughs> <laughs> There's the rat. If we want to start and solve the problems, we have to start with the most immediate ones. And in my view, the most immediate one is a divided community. How do we start to get it together? Maybe for the first time. Thank you. Doug, let me come to you next and add to that. But the same, the same question applies. Why is it that everything has changed but nothing has changed? Well, I have laid my dreams beneath your feet. Tread softly, for you tread on my dreams. Not a not a, a John Hewitt poem, but, it, but one by W.B. Yeats. Uh, and I suppose we have all dreamed uh, of a Northern Ireland that would be peaceful uh, and at ease with itself, and society would be uh, at ease with itself. Uh, I kind of watched this from afar, uh, being a soldier, serving around the world, uh, and it was brought into stark reality to me in, in 1989 when I deployed first of all to South Armagh, and then in 1990 when I deployed uh, to Fermanagh, um, at the same time when Patsy Gillespie was being strapped to a, a bomb and driven into Bunkrana, the same time a proxy bomb was being delivered to a checkpoint uh, south of Newry uh, and Cyril Smith uh, was blown to pieces, a friend of mine. So I kind of saw Northern Ireland as this ultra violent place, looking at it from the inside and not somewhere that belonged to me uh, as a Northern uh, Irishman or as an Irishman, use whatever prefix that, that you really want. But things moved on and, and there were some incredibly brave people who helped move things on and, 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 and Seamus is certainly one of them and many, many others. And I remember in 1998 when I was again serving overseas and my father, who's a Guildford man, who rang me and said, we're going to have the referendum on the Belfast Agreement. And I says, Dad, because he had my proxy vote, and I says, Dad, what are we going to do? And he says, do you know what? 
Don't. This is our one chance. It's not perfect. Many people are going to have to do terrible things here. Many people are going to suffer at the end of this process because they're going to accept something which they find that they don't want to. But if we don't vote for it, then we will never have peace in this country. And you, my son, will never ever be able to come home to Northern Ireland to live as a former soldier. So we voted in favour. And we had peace. And it's been an uneasy peace. And we know it's all been an uneasy peace. And nobody's pretending it's not been. But it has been a peace. And the things that were happening in 1987 or 1988. And remember those terrible incidents in 1988 in Gibraltar or in Milltown Cemetery or with the two corporals? Awful, awful things which showed the worst of Northern Ireland. They were all consigned in the most to the past. So we did have peace. And we have got peace. And in that, things have changed. But what we didn't do in 1998, and we've failed to do ever since, is address those big ticket items. Such as legacy. It's a festering sore that attacks us at every single minute. And now it's become a political tool for one community to bash another community through the two main political parties. The fact is, Doug, isn't it? And I would find this to shame us as well. Your two parties were the biggest parties in 1998 for a number of years afterwards. Those issues weren't addressed after 1998 as well. You, you let a metaphorical magpie into your nest. I, 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 absolutely, Peter. And I don't sit here uh, and, and say that I'm blameless or my party's blameless or anybody's blameless. The point I make is it was never dealt with. The Irish language was never dealt with. Education was never dealt with. Division was never dealt with. We run an apartheid education system here in Northern Ireland where we deliberately keep Catholic children away from Protestant children at the earliest ages. It's, it's absolutely terrible. And I've always said to bring communities together, bring people together, then children need to play together. They need to educate together. They need to work together. And they'll get to understand each other. That's really where I think we haven't. So where I agree with you that what has changed or nothing has changed, we have peace that has changed. What we haven't got is a community or a country with a calm sense of itself. Before I bring Naomi in, Seamus, let me put that same question to you. You were Deputy First Minister from 1998. Big ticket issues weren't being addressed, says Doug. You can't, you can't get away from those questions of the SDLP and Ulster Unionists as well, sure you can no, I don't intend to. The big ticket issues that we didn't do, by the way, were the whole question of policing was dealt with. That was a remarkable achievement. And that's one of the, <laughs> the few successful things emanating uh, from those, those years. The fair employment legislation, that's another big one. That's, that has been dealt with. You have so many of those things that should have been done before the Good Friday Agreement was reached. There never should have been a situation in a community such as ours with its built-in divisions that hadn't got a police service that could command the support of the entire community. It hadn't got sufficient legislation to make it a crime uh, to discriminate against uh, other people in terms of employment. Your last point was about the two parties. Uh, I'm not sure what point it is there. Well, I think the question I'm asking is, can you criticize the two main parties now when you were the two main parties for so long, and in a sense, if the magpie has taken over your nest, well, it's your fault for inviting them in. Well, I don't think we invited the magpies in. <laughs> I, I was in office with David Trimble for three years, and they watched the torment 
that his own party subjected himself to. It was unbelievable. I saw him coming out of a polling station in Banbridge on the day he lost his seat. And he was physically attacked in such a way that I hadn't seen in politics before. The dissatisfaction at that time, Dugan would have a better handle on it than me within the Ulster Unionist parties. But those who did that to David Trimble were more than magpies or scavengers. I make the point in relation to our own party. As we sat in Stormont as first and deputy first minister, trying to solve policing, trying to solve decommissioning, trying to deal with what was happening in Portadown and elsewhere. And as we were doing that, what were the two governments doing? Almost on a weekly basis, you had the Sinn Féin leadership in Downing Street with their friend Tony, or in uh, government buildings in Dublin with whoever was there then. And what was happening? They were making their deals with the magpies and the sinners in terms of how they would best be brought into the political process. And believe you me, that wasn't the only way in which they were bought. Naomi, why has everything changed? Why has nothing changed? Well, I'm going to start <clears throat> by saying that in 1987, I think I mentioned to you, I did my first O-level. I did it a year earlier, it was math. Um, and I was at school. Um, and I remember the 80s and early 90s very well um, in that I travelled through Belfast every day to go to Queen's from East Belfast to South Belfast um, when I was studying to be an engineer. And when I went to Queen's, it was really my first experience of being in a mixed community because I grew up in a very loyalist um, working class community just off the bottom of the Newton Arch Road in East Belfast. Um, And it was, I suppose, it was an eye opener for me because I was with people from all across Northern Ireland, but also people from right across the political spectrum of opinion. Um, And it changed me as a person because it was probably the first time when I realised that if we were ever going to see Northern Ireland change, it was going to have to be in a way that would accommodate all of those differences and actually make those a strength and not a weakness. Um, because unfortunately in Northern Ireland difference always seems to lead to division whether it's if you look at our churches and the way you've splinter (coughs) groups and whatever it might be or whether you look at communities um, where there are differences people always divide Um, and that's that's the process that Northern Ireland has been going through for a very long time Um, and it's that division that is the weakness not the difference the difference is something that in other countries is accommodated and indeed it's celebrated and it can be something that adds to the richness of society but we don't have that here and that was really the first time at university when I was challenged just about how much work needed to be done on that. So much has changed, I mean the Belfast that I live in now is a transformed place, it's unrecognisable from Belfast in 1987. Um, The city has opened, Um, it has become more vibrant, more exciting place to be Um, And so in some ways, everything has changed. But the same divisions, the same bitterness um, still exist. And I guess, why? Well, my argument would be that we had a political process that treated the symptoms, but not the disease. Because what we had with the troubles were pretty extreme symptoms of the disease of sectarianism. But the sectarianism was never treated. It was never dealt with. We never looked at our society and tried to root out that cause of hatred and mistrust and division. Um, Instead, we tried to accommodate um, that that mistrust through structures in the Good Friday Agreement, well-meaning structures, 
but structures that still to this day depend on us dividing unionist, nationalist and other for them to work. Um, so they embed within the assembly the very divisions um, that currently are the cause of its instability. Um, we never treated that underlying disease. That's a message the Alliance Party has been talking about for years and years. You go back to the 1980s, the vote was 7%. The vote today is not much more than that. It hasn't resonated with people. Yeah, and I, I, I accept that. I, I challenge you on that. I'd say it's 9% plus <laughs> these days, just, just for my own sake, if nothing else. But no, I mean, the, the reality is that what we are doing, in a sense, is it's playing a lonely furrow because the reason that the parties, the DUP and Sinn Féin, do so well in politics here is because division is fertile ground for fear and the politics of fear is the easiest politics in the world. Um, and if you ask me what has changed between then and now, actually in 1998 and 1997 with the talks, with the ceasefires, and I was at university then, 94, I was graduating and thinking, will it go away, will it stay, and I decided to stay. Because there was hope. The first time in my life there was a ceasefire. Um, and I, apart from the Christmas ones that we used to get the sort of token Christmas ceasefire, but there was a proper ceasefire in 1990, uh, 1994. And there was hope of change. And I think what has changed most is that that hope has gradually been worn down. And that people expected that by now we would be further on. People expected that we we would have delivered more, that the community would be more um, cohesive uh, and working together better, that the assembly would have delivered more in terms of policy, but also would have delivered this bigger reconciliation project. Because we always call it the peace process, but it wasn't really a peace process, it was a cessation of violence process and a political process, but the peace building never really got the same attention, and Seamus is quite right, if you look at the history of the executive, its biggest failing hasn't been running our education system or our health system or any of those things, its biggest failing has been addressing division in society and bringing forward proposals that are about trying to heal division, about trying to address the wounds of the past, but also about trying to build a shared sense of what it is to be a community because we base our identities, our political identities and so much more on our relationship with the border. But as a community in Northern Ireland, we have a relationship primarily with each other that will be there whether the border is or not. And very little is invested in that relationship by comparison to the political investment in our relationship with the border. And I think that that's what hasn't changed. And I think that's why division is still so deep rooted in our society. And I suspect that until we have the courage to deal with that division, we're not going to see the kind of change that people had. And I suspect that as we falter on, and I suspect the peace process will <coughs> falter on, people will become more and more disillusioned because the expectation that they had back in 1997 and 1998, that euphoria that was building, seems not to have been realised as it could have been. Okay, thank you. Same question to Stephen. I suppose that euphoria could be felt in the election. Now you have two Green MLAs that there wasn't in 1987. Yeah, um, I suppose my journey, if I go back 30 years, probably my memory that fits into the context of this conversation is, is sitting at the window of, of my house waiting for my mum to come home from work. She worked in Belfast City Centre. And if she was late, literally sitting at the window praying that she would come home. So it's interesting hearing the, the different panels' experiences. That that was mine of those times. I was fortunate in some ways where I grew up. Like Naomi, it was a kind of working class loyalist area, but it was surrounded with other working class loyalist areas. So it wasn't really, it wasn't on a peace line. The conflict was was a bit away from us. Um, but my mum worked in Belfast, and that, that, that's where my fear and my experience of it came from. Uh, sort of shooting forward to, to 1998, um, I turned 18 in 1997, and the, the, the referendum was my first ever vote, and, and I voted in favour of the agreement. And I attended the, <clears throat> the, the kind of famous waterfront concert and saw the, the, the handshake between John Hume and David Trimble, and... 
and I, I was one of those 18 year olds with hope you know this is this is the kind of beginning of the end of the troubles and the beginning of 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 peace of reconciliation and and all the hopes we had with that and uh, and my take sort of similar to, to Peter's conclusion is is I'm I'm proud of how far we've come and frustrated that we haven't gone further faster and I'm proud because as has been pointed out by others we have had to a large degree a, a, a peace you know the the soldiers are off the streets you don't get your bags checked in Belfast City Centre center anymore and and my children don't worry about me coming home in the same way maybe I worried about my parents but how, how is the Green Party going to make that breakthrough it's the same sort of question <coughs> I know how many the has gone up from 7 to 9%. You could argue that's a third of an increase. That's significant. Two green MLAs? Well, I, I think keep doing what we're doing in the constituencies where we've been elected and grow that in the other constituencies. I think the, I think the mistake, I think part of the, the, the problem, again, I go back to 1998 and it was the People's Agreement. And then... Unfortunately, after that, and particularly since, and we can keep saying this because they're not here, since the, the, the DUP and Sinn Féin have, have, have taken power, they've taken power and guarded it jealously. And I always say it was the People's Agreement. Well, in St Andrews, the St Andrews Agreement was signed three weeks after an election. The people never got their say. They changed our agreement. DUP boasted there, or overstated their case and said, We've completely changed the Good Friday Agreement. Well, you'd no right to. We voted for it, or 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 there was a deception and they they tweaked it and, and and no more. But one way or another, that began the democratic deficit. The Good Friday Agreement is our constitution, and we've been excluded from changes from it. And I say we as as citizens, each change that's been made, they've been agreed between the DUP and Sinn Féin and governments behind closed doors. We need to go back to involving our citizens in decision making, whether it's intractable issues like dealing with the past, um, Irish Language Act, whatever it might be. If we just look across the border, they're having citizens' assemblies to fundamentally change issues in the Republic of Ireland. Where's our assemblies for citizens? Why is it all down to politicians? Why is it all deals done behind closed doors? And how many crises, crises have we had where a deal behind, done behind closed doors patched it for a while. If we want a long-term lasting solution, we need an agreement that's endorsed by the people again. We need to reform, review and revitalise the Good Friday Agreement. I'm going to come to the audience, but I can't resist saying this. Uh, Citizens' Assembly in the South that has produced recommendations on Article 8 of the Constitution and followed on from the Constitutional Convention that led to the same-sex marriage referendum. I contacted them and went down and met the head of the Citizens' Assembly. Great conversation for two hours and said, this is fantastic. What you're doing is incredible. You must be contacted from everybody around the world. <laughs> and they said, yeah, from South America, from Scandinavia, from parts of Africa. And I said, I'm sure 40 miles up the road uh, in Northern Ireland as well. And she said, no, you're the first and only contact I've had from anybody in Northern Ireland. Quite incredible. Mm. Anyway, leave that aside. We'll take uh, two or three from the audience, put them to the panel, we'll come back to the audience, back and forth as, as much as we can. So if you want to make a comment or ask a question, please raise your hands and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll take it to the panel. Who wants to be first? Chap up there. Anybody else uh, want to indicate? And, and then there. We'll take, the, take and, and then there. We'll take these three first. Peter, thanks very much, um, and, and thank you, thank all the members of the panel for all their interesting and diverse but almost synchronised perspectives. Uh, my name is Justin McNulty, I'm an MLA from near Yarmouth. Um, obviously one of the people who I admire most in life is, is a member of the panel. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and his name is James Bond. <laughs> We've mentioned legacy, and I want to discuss the legacy of a different nature, I guess. Growing up, I came to know the importance of the legacy built by a, a Gaelic football team. And they were the Armagh Gaelic football team of 1953. And they're in my mind because I attended a funeral of 
one of those pairs just two weeks ago who Seamus would be familiar with, and Seamus being a pastor, I'm up there also. And in following Seamus' footsteps, I recognize also I got huge boots to fill, and possibly I could never use his boots. But the question is, that team left a legacy which ultimately paved the way for, for great success for the team I played on. What legacy is political leadership? Is the political leadership of the north of Ireland providing for our futures, Thank for you. our combined futures? Thank you. We'll not come to the panel just yet. There's a chat there, and then uh, up at the back there after uh, the chat with the hoodie t-shirt thing on. Uh, but yourself first. Uh, my name is Donald Lemon. Uh, in essence, if you strip away the sentiment, a, a government is merely a service provider, like your phone or your bank. Uh, we, now and again, we change that service provider. If there's going to be a border poll in the next few years, the options for changing our service provider will change, uh, will be much greater, uh, including the fact of being in Europe or out of Europe with the UK. Uh, how do you see those options being presented to people? Thank you. And the last question before we go back to the panel. Yes, please. I think I'm still formulated it here. Um, I, I suppose. Uh, I'm surprised that I, myself as a socialist republican that I find myself in agreement green with the unionists uh, here insofar as uh, that there has been progress that the, the, uh, the violence uh, has stopped to enable politics to take place and um, my, um, I suppose I feel a little bit like the LGBT community here insofar as that, that orange and green doesn't have a great resonance for me, but we have to start there. I'm mindful of what Helen Kennedy said today, that we're talking in terms of 30 or 40 years, it's not a long time in politics. And surely we are now at a position where we are getting frustrated, I certainly agree with, with that. But then that's for us to take up that mantle and to move it forward. And my question to you is then that if, if you agree we're at that stage and we need to grapple with those, as Shane says quite rightly, those basic divisions, how do each of you intend to grapple uh, with uh, separated communities, separated schools, uh, and, and, uh, that creates that, that, uh, that divide? Thanks very much. Uh, let, me, let me turn uh, first to Seamus. Legacy of political leadership. What do you think the legacy was from the eighties and nineties, given where we are now? And what do you think the legacy is of the current leadership? Not sure what legacy means in those terms. <coughs> I know what it means in terms of what happened in various ways and times in in in, in relation to violence. What, as a, as a boy, been reared in Market Hill. What did I, what was my perception of politics? I can tell you who stood for the Unionist Party in uh, 1940 or 50 something. Bet you there's nobody else, could. Don't ask <laughs> Colonel Harding was his name. Now, how did I know that? I knew that because children were coming from another school along the same road as we were coming. And, of course, the them and the us got into action. And uh, I heard many shots in favour of <laughs> Colonel Harding. You're not going to tell us the nationalist candidate was called Laurel, are you? No, he's called, <laughs> he was called Riley. Yeah, and I know that because again, the them and the us started to do a little bit of microphone stuff at the age of somewhere around nine, eight, nine, ten. My next experience of politics was when I Amanda Booth in the polling station in Market Hill, not for any nationalists, but for a man 
whom I regarded most highly, the first president of the Alliance Party. Now, for my sins, I got a pretty substantial brick on the back of my head as I was coming, walking out the road home. There's a type of confusion that we have if we don't have the type of legacy, to use that word, that we can look up to, that we can respect. I just pose the question in the present day terms. I'm quite sure there'll be a, a question on culture and I don't intend to, don't hope I, I, I anticipate it. But what makes a good orange man? What makes a good Republican who's prepared to take up violence? Where does that come from? That doesn't come except for the circumstances surrounding those people. And answer me this if I can, because I can't. And I know one of the most lethal members of the provisional IRA, and I mean lethal many times. We went to Mass every morning. And I find it hard to reconcile the concept of what I know to be decent, hard-working, non-demonstrative unionist keeps his place tidy, pays his debts, owes money to nobody, and is a, uh, an example for all of us. What need has he to dress up in garish uniform, maybe six or seven times a year, uh, with the sashes and armbands and all? What need is there for that? No. The very logic of what I was saying earlier is this. If we're going to try and expand the them and the us, right, we can only do that if we accept the person as the person wants to be, to, to be no one else. There's no point in us, you, me, or anybody else, putting a definition on <coughs> a young Republican who hasn't had the legacy that he needed, or someone in the unionist community, some young fellow probably, who could take no more of seeing his mates being killed and decided he would do a bit of it himself. If, we're not, if we go to start to gra grab with, grapple with this, I think we have to start on those roads. Those were roads, of course, if you go back to the 70s and 80s, it took us into a very dark period with some of those young people. Naomi, do you want to respond to some of those questions? What legacy do you think you or others are leaving? <coughs> even in the context of Brexit? I guess for all politicians, the legacy you leave is unfinished business because there will always be more work to be done. So I don't think that that's unique to any generation of politicians. Um, I guess the legacy that I would see, if you like people like Seamus and David Trimble and others have left, if you like, was the, the fact that there was an absence of violence for the first time um, in, in my lifetime um, and the opportunity for politics to take precedence over violence and to me that, that is a massive legacy that we've inherited. What worries me now is that people have become complacent about it and I go back to this issue about treating symptoms and not looking at the cause. 
Um, I actually think that the causes of the violence that sparked in the 60s and 70s haven't gone away. And I think that part of the problem is that we don't deal with the causes simply because there's been a cessation in the symptoms that we could see through carelessness and stupidity and the progress that we have made being frittered away. And that's my fear for the current generation of politicians who want to be sitting in the assembly now doing their jobs, as I I know you do and I do, um, but can't do that because of, of the situation that we're in at the moment. And I think that we treat what we have, the peace that we have, um, at times very very glibly and very lightly, as though it's robust mm-hmm. enough to sustain anything. And I got, I guess, a window about how, how thin the veneer between mob rule and democracy can be um, over the flag decision in City Hall. Um, and I have, I mean, I think anybody who felt that Northern Ireland was at peace with itself and could sustain difficult p- political decisions and, and, and make progress and behave like a normal society, um, I think got a rude awakening over that decision and the way it was reacted to um, and the venom in the reaction that came about. Now, there are lots of political reasons why that happened, but it's, it gives us an insight into just how unstable um, and how fragile the peace we have is because underneath what we have, what looks like stability, it's as though we have tectonic plates. We have two communities that rub alongside each other and sometimes that's fine and there's just a bit of friction. But like in any earthquake zone, sometimes something gives. And it's when that happens that you get the big the big collapses, the big problems. And I think we become very um, I think we become far too accepting of the status quo and not ambitious enough at times for the change that we need to make and I think at times of peace and stability when the assembly's functioning we almost think phew it hasn't collapsed for a few weeks that's great just keep it going like that and don't do anything mad but the problem is that we're not doing anything at all other than treading water a lot of the time and so we're not making the kind of process uh, progress that would underpin what's happening in the assembly and make sure that it's not going to collapse in eight months nine months ten months so for me I think that there is a legacy question and I think it's for our generation to deal with and that is what do we do with the legacy we inherited. We've been given an opportunity to take this up, to move it forward another stage and if you look back at when, when Seamus was talking about 87 through 1998 and, and, and so on and you look at the, the decisions that had to be made, the gulf that had to be crossed to get the Good Friday Agreement, to get the Assembly up and running, the patience that people needed with each other, personally as well as politically, to make it work. And you consider that we're sitting here now with an Assembly suspended over things like, will there be a standalone Irish Language Act? Not will there be an act that deals with the Irish language, but will it be standalone? And will we do this? Will we? Minutia. In many ways, the gaps between people have closed politically. But the depth of animosity is just as great. Oh. And I think that's the bit that we're not dealing with. It's that depth of, of, of distrust. And let me, let me go to Stephen and then to Doug and, and ask you to, to, to keep the answers reasonably brief. I want to get the audience back in on some issues as well. Stephen, is that because of a lack of ambition? Is it because people aren't able to stand on the shoulders of giants like yeah. Seamus and David Trumbull and Ian Paisley? Or is it uh, for some other reason? I think the comes to legacy the big fear I have is we're next year we're coming to 20 years since the Good Friday Agreement and it's not to be beyond the realms of possibility that we could have no assembly 20 years on and I think that symbolically and symbols are important in Northern Ireland politics although they can be overplayed at times but symbolically to reach the 20th anniversary with no assembly I think would be heartbreaking um, to come to your question, why, why is, as Naomi said, the, the issues seem much smaller, um, the animosity. I, I, think, I think it's about will. I think we've had six months now of no assembly and that starts to become normal. The urgency is going. Um, you need, for crisis talks and, and that kind of panic almost, you need an urgency and the urgency has gone. Um, and, and I have to say, I, I think the blame does lie at the door of the DUP and Sinn Féin, but the Secretary of State has to take responsibility in that regard. I don't think he has, he has been the kind of driving force to, to pull things together. Um, 
But I, I, I suppose I'd rather talk about what we can do, the possibilities, the, the, the positives. And there, there, there is opportunity that uh, Naomi referred to the legacy we've been given to take the next step. But it does have to be around those issues of how we educate our children, looking forward to the next generation. You know, genuine integrated education, and I'll, I'll say it, it's controversial, not shared education, yeah. not two different schools here, going into different doors of the same building here, here. and being told, well, we don't, you know, different uniforms. I did that. I, I went to Grosvenor, if Peter, Peter knows it well. We were beside Orangefield. We weren't shared. We were enemies. And we were both Protestant schools. Um, so, <laughs> but because we were told we were different, because we had different uniforms, we Stay got us. We, we stayed schools, whatever. Protestant. Um, <laughs> but we, we were told we were different because we were given different uniforms. And we had a system, in that case, segregated us because of academic here's ability. The thing, here's the thing, and let me put this to Doug, uh, and Naomi can come in as well, and, and Shane. Because all of the parties, uh, and we think the Greens qualified, went into the opposition. So the Good Friday Agreement had conditions within it that said we're all in this together, we're all in the executive together. But you all, went, you all went into the opposition. And that encouraged, to use a military term, Doug, green on green and blue on blue action rather than uh, across community politics. So are, are, is your party, Doug, not as responsible as any other party for a lack of ambition or a lack of vision or a lack of being able to move this thing forward? Because you all play politics. We're, we're, all I mean, of you. We're, we're, we're all responsible in some shape or form, but an opposition is normal politics. To have a government and an opposition to hold them to account is absolutely normal politics. But this is so, a normal society. And, and, and we, when we, when we try to move towards a normal society, we can either look back or we can look forward. So the aim of opposition was try and have a normalised society where your government would stand up and give a policies and an opposition would stand up and give an alternative. That's normalising um, politics. So and that, and that was a mixed approach to the and agreement. That, the bits of it you like, you'll say, are fundamentally important. The bits of it you think you can take political advantage of you will go in the opposition. Well, well the, the Assembly voted to have an opposition. We, we brought that, um, that legislation in, so we had the ability to have an opposition. So we used that opposition, and that was an attempt to try and normalise it. And I think that Mike Nesbitt was very, very brave in the elections following that. When he tried to normalise um, politics, we tried to make it that it wasn't a sectarian headcount. Because what we're losing here now is we're losing that legacy. We're frittering it away. Um, you know, we've stood on the shoulders of great men uh, in 1998, we even and stood women. On, uh, and women and women. Sorry, yes, you're absolutely right. Um, and indeed, in in 2000, and indeed in 2000, uh, and 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 six seven um, with Ian Paisley and Martin McGuinness, um, and we do not now have those leaders um, who can take us any further forward than where we are right at this moment in time. Seamus talks about them and um, politics, and he's absolutely right. But we also have this horrible win lose. Um, politics as well, where if you as a political party give way in any shape or form, your class is losing. And if you get what you're after, your class is winning. And as soon as you get that, you stand up and you applaud your, yourself for winning something. And, and that's what we're finding, for example, with the Irish language. And that's why it's so indetractable. It's because if Sinn Féin was to get an Irish language act as an example, and I'm pleased I'm only using it as an example, they would be jumping from the rafters to say, we won. And if the DUP were to give them an Irish Language Act, they would be classed as losing out. Okay. That's the terrible way of, of, of doing politics. I want to go back to you on this in a moment. Briefly, Naomi and Seamus. I think, well, I think there are a couple of things. I mean, I think developing opposition in politics isn't new. First of all, we were in opposition from the beginning, not by choice, but because that's how the electorate voted. So we weren't in the executive at the beginning. Um, we only entered the executive with the devolution of justice because they couldn't agree um, on anybody else to be justice minister. They came to Lance and asked if we would do it. We then got a, point, a position in the executive as of right. Um, and so that changed things. But the the... The mandatory, you always hear this mandatory call. It was never mandatory to take your seats. It was mandatory that you were offered them. You didn't have to take them. This idea that people had to be in government together. The only parties that have to be in government together are the two largest from each of the two traditions. And that's it. Beyond that, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of choice whether or not you go in and always was. The only thing that changed with the legislation actually that went through Stormont was you got paid to be in opposition. Um, you got paid more for your party. It was, it was nothing more than that. So from our point of view, it was we went... To go into opposition, no, I don't believe so. I actually think it was the right thing to do. And I'll say why. 
we went into government at a time when I think it was crucial that we did it, and I actually proposed David Ford as Justice Minister. I thought it was hugely important that we were there at that time. I also thought it was important that we stayed in beyond that initial kind of short period uh, where David was Justice Minister, when the Assembly could have collapsed over the justice devolution issue, but it didn't because we resolved it. But again, it was a patch repair. It wasn't a complete resolution. This, what we found towards the end of that mandate was that we were no longer in a coalition in anything other than name. What we found was that we had Sinn Féin and the DUP having their own meetings outside the executive. Some of the executive meetings lasted 15 minutes because they would come in and just vote through what they wanted. At some point, there is a responsibility on those of us in politics also to hold others to account for their failings. And we couldn't do that with credibility and with integrity because we believe that if you're in the executive, you have to show collective responsibility. Okay. So we couldn't be in the executive and critical of it, and that's why we ended up in opposition. Okay. Where I do think, if briefly, very briefly. briefly, where I do think that there is a real challenge is whether or not those two parties were mature enough to be in government. To me, the failing wasn't the opposition. The failing was of the government. They weren't actually mature enough to rule together okay. because they like to have smaller parties onto which they can spread the blame. Okay, I want to go back to the audience. Briefly, Seamus, if you could, and then we'll go back. <coughs> yeah, could I put it this way? The Good Friday Agreement is a contrivance. <coughs> of course it's a contrivance. It had to be built block by block to, to get anywhere. Then we ask the question, why did it have to be a contrivance? Why could it not be normal politics like Westminster? But now Westminster is abnormal politics <laughs> in comparison with France. So here you have a situation where the contrivances didn't begin with the Good Friday Agreement, by the way. It started in 1921. And what was the contrivance then? To create a Northern Ireland where there would be a permanent Protestant Unionist majority. That was the contrivance. What was the next contrivance? Next contrivance was Sunningdale. A very good contrivance, by the way. <laughs> Didn't get its chance. And the next one, if there's a next one, if there is another contrivance, if there's another attempt to uh, structurally deal with this problem, it will be a contrivance too. Now, any contrivance is going to uh, not please some people and will please other people. But that, that very brief, I mean, I, I do want to go back, but it does lead to a question from, from an SDLP perspective. If it's a contrivance to get everybody in government, was it not a mistake then to go into the opposition and break the contrivance? Yes. My view, as my colleagues know, was that we shouldn't have. Why? For this reason, the DUP have made no secret of the fact that they're going to change this damn thing in such a way that it will become their, their agreement. It will become their way forward. And believe it or not, Sinn Féin are doing exactly the same thing. They want to put their stamp on it. Don't forget, St Andrews was the DUP having a go at this. The, when the Sinn Féin are now doing it, they want their stamp on it. They want any SDLP footprint on it. Wiped out. Okay. That's what they're at. Thank you. And that's what they have done. And I'll just make a last point. Briefly, please. Can you, yeah. How can you explain the way in which two parties like the Ulster Unionist Party and the SDLP, who kept faith in the political process, who kept hope alive when it was dying on the verge of a civil war. How do you create peace by doing away with that middle ground? Okay. I've been told there's five minutes left, but I'm going to extend it beyond there, if that's okay. So there's uh, here, first question, second question, then over there, and the third question at the back. 
Um, this morning we heard from Helena Kennedy about how the international human rights um, process was set up after the Second World War. She talked about how people came together to finally agree at the UN Declaration on Human Rights and none of the people who came together had uh, clean hands, she said. And um, I know that you know, one of the great things about the Good Friday Agreement was the rights, human rights element that was written in. And I know that the rights has become again, something that the parties can't agree on now. But I'd like to hear from you as a panel, as I'd like to hear from you about how rights as a set of ideals could help us out of this situation. Thank you. Uh, there's a, another point over there I can't quite see. Was it a oh, it's right. Okay. So how, how do rights play into the politics of uh, today? Uh, Yvonne Boyle, um, I felt the last election was a very polarising election uh, and I felt the American election was very polarising and I felt the Brexit referendum was very polarising. So what I want to ask the panel, who I believe are really the moderates in this situation, and I'm sorry Sinn Féin and the DUP didn't send representatives, what can politicians do and what can ordinary people, ordinary activists do in that very polarised situation? Because what I try and do is, I try and keep the DUP I know and Sinn Féin I know on my Twitter feed and on my Facebook feed, it's not easy. But have you any other? Okay. And the question up at the back, um, now after this question, I'm going to go to the panel and then back out to the audience for a last time because I'm told we've got 10 minutes at most. So I'm going to ask the panel to keep their responses brief and then I'll go back out for a last round. Please, over to you. Uh, well, first of all, I hope the reason that uh, DUP and Sinn Féin are not here is because they're hanging their heads in shame. Um, and if they're not, they certainly ought to be. Um, because um, it's an absolute disgrace to, to be sitting here uh, six months on after uh, an election to be witnessing the sham that is the current status of events in Scotland. But I wanted to say basically about a shared future. How can we have a shared future if we don't have a shared present? And to label myself, and I don't like labels, to say that I am basically a South Armagh Protestant. And I was in my mid-teens before I knew there was a difference in community. I, I think I said well, and as Seamus said, let's, let's the, get us, the, question. the us and the them type of attitude. And I honestly, I was brought up in a house Okay. Not with a difference with people to see the humanity in people before you saw the politics in people. Okay. And um, is the key not sure for everyone to move on in Northern Ireland? Shared education, because it's only with that that you see the humanity first. Okay. And not the politics. Okay. In the to, thank you. To the panel, and, and jump in first to whoever wants to. Rights-based approach, uh, in a general sense, how do we move on uh, with this segregated society? What do we do as individuals? Can, can I quickly jump on the individual? I thought it was quite funny when we talk about being a polarised society. I stood in the last um, general election, and I remember, because I always put the posters up myself, I hate posters, but I put them up, and I was up the, the ladder putting a poster up, and this guy came up and says to me, Doug, good luck to you. You're going to be the best man for Upper Ban. We need MPs like you because you can see the other side and they're decent people and you'll make sure that we can all work together. I says, thank you. He says, I can't vote for you though um, <laughs> because we've got to keep them in sight. <laughs> um, uh, and and, and that's, that, that's where we are. It's incredibly difficult to, to, to counter that except for um, to show respect. Um, and, and I've got to say, I, I've got huge differences uh, with all political parties. Um, and they'll have differences with me. But I've got to say, I respect difference. I respect where they come from. I respect uh, what they want to achieve. Um, somebody who wants a, 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 a unified United Ireland, if they do it peacefully, that is a fair ask. Uh, I'm an Ulster Unionist. I want to stay part of the United Kingdom. I do that peacefully. That's a fair ask. 
you have to respect that. And your point at the back, if I can just really just add to that, you know, what you said, I think, is absolutely right. You know, we need to have a shared education. And I said that earlier on because we need to move ourselves forward. And that's the silver bullet for me. That is absolutely the silver okay, bullet. Naomi? I'm going to start with rights because yeah, I yeah, think yeah. actually the rights-based um, approach to politics is one that's really important. And I'm concerned that many of the rights that we enjoy as a society are underpinned by the EU and that we're going to, in some way, find ourselves with fewer rights than we had before. I think that's something we should be conscious of. But I think in terms of rights in Northern Ireland, people are really, really good at talking about their own rights. I would love people to talk about other people's rights um, with the same kind of passion and energy that they talk about exercising their own. I mean, for me, rights, there are three parts of it. There's, there's rights, responsibility and respect. And unless you've got all three, a rights-based agenda alone won't actually deliver. So you've got to have people who are responsible in the exercise of their rights, and you've also got to have respect for the rights of other people. Rights come into conflict. You've got to have ways of resolving those conflicts in a respectful way. So I think rights are hugely important, um, but, but I do think that you need the other two things to counterbalance it. In terms of how we change society from where we are now to where we want to be, Actually, it will be small steps, but I think one of the biggest things we could do is integrate education, because around a school there is a community, around a community there is housing, around, uh, around housing there, there is opportunity, and unless we actually desegregate our schools, unless we go that far to actually bring our children together at an early age, we will continue to perpetuate the sense that we are so innately different that we can't share the same space for work and play and life. But we will also build communities around schools that themselves become segregated. So I think if you want a key that unlocks it, um, that's, that's one of the, 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 the core things we can do. And as for what we do as people, I think we challenge Yvonne. I think that's what, I think that's what we all have to do. We all hear the, the, the hatred. We all hear the comments that Doug's talking about. We hear the themins and the usins. We do what Seamus does. We go to the bar where people whisper behind our backs and wonder why we're there, because we don't quite belong. Instead of allowing spaces to become segregated, we should embrace them and make them ours so that they belong to all of us. OK, I'm being told we've no time to go back out to the audience. So I'm going to ask the panellists to sum up with the last question. and. Uh, uh, Stephen and, and Seamus, you can touch on those questions if you want in the summing up for a, a minute or so each. I want you to talk to us about the next 30 years. Uh, I want you to tell us what you think it's going to look like here and what needs to happen to make it a positive 30 years. So let me start off with you first, Stephen. Okay, uh, I'll touch briefly on the, the, the question of polarisation and move to my summing up. Um, because we, we, we have had polarised elections and I think um, I, I think the only positive outcome can see people can see what happens when you vote for that. So we've had Trump and I think America's starting to realise what it voted for. We've had Brexit and the EU referendum and I hope and believe we get a referendum on the final deal because I think when people see what no, it looks like no, they'll want to change their mind um, and we've, we've had polarisation here and we've had collapse so again people need to see what they got and change what they do in terms of how they vote in terms of the next 30 years I'm going to be honest I can't tell you what's going to happen in the next three months um, Politics has never been so changeable, <coughs> and, and I've spoke. I'm relatively inexperienced, but I spoke to people who've been in politics 30, 40 years, and they've said they've never seen a time like it. So, so anybody who tells you what's happening at Christmas, um, they, they they they're a better person than me. But I can tell you what I hope. I, I I do hope the assembly is back up and running, but I do think we need to have that genuine reform. We need to re-engage citizens in the process. Politics shouldn't happen to you. It should be something you're part of. And I, I think the Citizens' Assembly and the Constitutional Convention in the South, which I was part of, um, can lead the way in how it's done. Um, the model's there. It's, it's, it's not far away. We don't have to travel across the world to get it. Um, and maybe we can look past the fact that it's the Republic of Ireland and, and, um, and just see that it works and it's a good model. And big, big societal change in decisions are made when people are given the power to make those decisions. And that's where I'd like to see us go over the next 
number of months, never mind the next 30 years. Thank you. Naomi, <laughs> Naomi you're still young enough that in 30 years' time you could just be coming to your tenure, ending your tenure as First Minister. Is it <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, well, let's wait and see. Um, what, what do you think will happen in the next 30 years? Wow. In the next 30 years, I mean, it's really hard to tell. I mean, I think as Stephen says, we're in a time of unprecedented change and challenge. Um, I think what he says about disconnection of people from, the, from politics has actually affected our politics in a very negative way in that people vote out of protest. They don't elect people who will serve them. They elect people who will annoy other people who want to be elected and that's not a very good way to go about choosing a government um, but the big change that I would like to see I guess is that one where I started um, we, we still define ourselves primarily here in Northern Ireland in the Assembly and out of it um, through our relationship with the border um, and with Brexit and everything else that's coming down the line that could become more and more acute over the next number of years. We need to start defining ourselves as a society by our relationships with each other <coughs> in Northern Ireland. We need to put those relationships first um, because if we don't do that, we will continually be buffeted by change that is beyond our control, as for example Brexit was. And it's not good for Northern Ireland to be constantly a hostage um, of fortune to what happens with the border. I believe we can build a stable, integrated society. I believe that we can build one which has optimism and hope. We can choose to celebrate our differences rather than be fearful about them. But it starts with value in the relationships that we have with each other um, rather than simply measuring ourselves by our relationship with the border. And I think when we get to that point, uh, we'll have a much better opportunity. The big challenge in all of that is that I think increasingly the move at the moment politically is away from that interdependence on which the Good Friday Agreement was built. That interdependence with us within Europe, the interdependence between nations, and I hope that that is a temporary move because actually our, the, the world now is a small place and what happens in one place has an impact on another almost immediately. And I think we would be fools to throw away that sense of interdependence, that sense of interconnectedness, because for us in Northern Ireland, that was, that was the chief thing that led to the peace. The sense that people could be fully British, fully Irish, and live in Northern Ireland and be part of this society. That was hugely important. Um, and we have got to embrace that. And being part of the EU made that easier, because it made borders softer. Um, and we need to be really cautious as we go forward that we maintain that sense um, of place in Northern Ireland and that we don't lose it to external factors. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. Um, could be Sir Douglas in 30 years' time. It could be Lord Beatty of Upper Ban. Uh, regardless of what happens to you, what do you think will happen to this part of the world? I, listen, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of pessimistic, um, and I think I will remain pessimistic uh, until... Uh, Brexit is done and dusted, uh, and we've moved beyond it, and we've got it out of the way, and we find our way in the world uh, as the United Kingdom uh, outside of the European Union. Now, I voted to stay. That's not the point. The point is we're moving to leave, and I think we need to get that out of the way. So I, I think I would probably remain pessimistic till, 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 till that's gone uh, and done and dusted. I'm also slightly ashamed uh, as I sit here as well. Why am I ashamed? Because I'm elected MLA. I'm a legislator, and I'm not doing my job. Uh, and that is an absolute shame. Shame on me, shame on my party, shame on all the political parties that we can't get together and sort this out for the good of the people of Northern Ireland. Uh, and, and I will remain shamed uh, until we finally uh, get together. I'm an Irish Unionist. The Shamrock belongs to me, the Irish language belongs to me, the Gaelic Games belong to me, St Patrick's Day, the Sash, God Save the Queen, the Orange Order, they're all mine. It's part of Northern Ireland. It's part of what I believe in. All of these things. And I respect all people in this, uh, in this country. And I understand that some people uh, have, have visions which take them in a completely different direction from me. And I absolutely respect that. And I will only become optimistic is when we start to absolutely respect difference. When we do sort out the education. When we can stand on the same football terraces and cheer on the same team regardless of where you come from and what society that you live in and I think that will come because I think it will come because I think the people are getting absolutely bored with the political classes and I think they will drive change and the sooner they drive change the sooner this will be a better place.
And the last word, Seamus, you've, uh, I think there's very few people in this part of the world can reach back into our recent past. And uh, the, import, the, the secret of knowing the future is to understand the past. Give us your experience. What's going to happen, do you think, in the next 30 years? Well, for certain, I'll not be here. <laughs> you not be Lord Mallon, no. I've turned that down. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't want to be a hypocrite. <laughs> um, in relation to that point, I'm 80 odd years of age, right? The one thing that I think each one of us has in our own capacity is to be good ancestors as opposed to being good rememberers. Think about it. We, we have a remembrance for everything, real and imagined. <laughs> But we're not thinking too much of what we are going to leave behind. Are we going to leave a place like it is now for our those who come after us, grandchildren, great grandchildren? With all the scars on it, with all of the evilness that we saw. So I'd recommend that as we get nearer the end, as I am, and thinking more about how I can be a good ancestor than a good rememberer. I come from a Republican tradition, a violent Republican tradition. Right. It took me almost 80 years of age to come to grips with all of the falsities that <laughs> I have heard, seen and read about over the years. I'm quite sure that applies to all sections of the community. I just leave you with one thought, Spinoza, the uh, uh, philosopher, said that uh, peace wasn't just an absence of war, that it was an attitude of mind, a disposition towards benevolence, confidence and justice. Benevolence, confidence and justice. Surely those are three great starting points with which from which to look at the overall problems. And I would like to see two things happening. I stop now, term. <clears throat> I would like to see a complete uh, study of unionism, not by me, but by unions. Because I am <laughs> fairly well convinced, you know, that it's not as stable a thing as some might think. This, the political mind in London has moved, and having wrote, moved on. And I think we should bear that in mind. So I want to know what unionism is. When are they going to let us down again? When are they going to let unionists fight the next battle for them and then disown them when it comes to the talk after the talks after that battle? I want the same done. I'd like to see the same done with Republicans. What is it? A United Ireland. <coughs> What is a United Ireland? Is it a federal Ireland? A confederal Ireland? And if it isn't either of those things, 
what's wrong with the United States of America. All of those issues have got to be looked at because let's not have any more decades in our history where the old lie puts young men and women in graves and the, pe the people who tell them the old lies then reap the rewards of their awful of their awful uh, role in it all. Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. It is a good and noble thing to die for one's country. Is it? I leave it there. something away from this, I take a lot of things, but that concept of whatever we do, we always do thinking about what our children and grandchildren and their children will think be good ancestors, don't necessarily be somebody good just at remembering. Can I ask you to join me again in thanking Naomi, Steve, Seamus and Doug. Thank you very much.